Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, we bring you two more stories in honor of Black History Month Desiree's Baby by Kate Chopin, and The Sheriff's Children by Charles W. Chestnut. Kate Chopin is not African American, but I feel this particular story is appropriate here because this week we reflect on mixed race, as is Chestnut. Charles W. Chestnut was born of parents who were free persons of color, and his grandfather was a slave owner. He was considered a quadroon, 25% black. A mulatto was understood to be 50% black. Assigning terminology to describe a degree of blackness. Thankfully, we have moved past this, haven't we? Chestnut had a wealth of personal experience to write about the complexities of mixed-race social status in the South. And now, Desiree's Baby by Kate Chopin. As the day was pleasant, Madame Valmond drove over to Albury to see Desiree and the baby. It made her laugh to think of Desiree with a baby— why, it seemed almost yesterday that Desiree was little more than a baby herself, when Monsieur, in riding through the gateway of Valmond, had found her lying asleep in the shadow of a big stone pillar. The little one awoke in his arms and began to cry for Dada. That was as much as she could do or say. Some people thought she might have strayed there on her own accord, for she was of the toddling age. The prevailing belief was that she had been purposely left by a party of Texans whose canvas-covered wagon late in the day had crossed the ferry that Coton May kept, just below the plantation. In time, Madame Volman abandoned every speculation but the one that Desiree had been sent to her by a beneficent providence to be the child of her affection, seeing that she was without child of the flesh." for the girl grew to be beautiful and gentle, affectionate and sincere, the idol of Valmond. It was no wonder when she stood one day against the stone pillar in whose shadow she had lain asleep eighteen years before, that Armand Aubigny riding by and seeing her there had fallen in love with her. That was the way all the Aubignys fell in love, as if struck by a pistol shot. The wonder was that he had not loved her before— for he had known her since his father brought him home from Paris, a boy of eight, after his mother had died there. The passion that awoke in him that day, when he saw her at the gate, swept along like an avalanche, or like a prairie fire, or anything that drives headlong over all obstacles. Monsieur Volmond grew practical and wanted things well considered, that is, the girl's obscure origin— Armand looked into her eyes and did not care. He was reminded that she was nameless. What did it matter about a name when he could give her one of the oldest and proudest in Louisiana? He ordered the corbet from Paris and contained himself with what patience he could until it arrived. Then they were married. Madame Valmond had not seen Desiree and the baby for four weeks. When she reached Libri, she shuddered at the first sight of it as she always did. It was a sad-looking place, for which many years had not known the gentle presence of a mistress, old Monsieur Aubigny having married and buried his wife in France, and she having loved her own land too well to ever leave it. The roof came down steep and black like a cowl, reaching out beyond the wide galleries that encircled the yellow stuccoed house. Big, solemn oaks grew close to it, and their thick-leaved, far-reaching branches shadowed it like a pall. Young Aubigny's rule was a strict one, too, and under it his negroes had forgotten how to be gay, as they had been during the old master's easy-going and indulgent lifetime. The young mother was recovering slowly, and lay full length in her soft white muslins and laces upon a couch. The baby was beside her, upon her arm, where he had fallen asleep at her breast. The yellow nursewoman sat beside a window fanning herself. Madame Volmond bent her portly figure over Desiree and kissed her, holding her an instant tenderly in her arms. 
Then she turned to the child. This is not the baby, she exclaimed in startled tones. French was the language spoken at Valmond in those days. I knew you would be astonished, laughed Desiree, at the way he has grown. Look at his legs, Mama, and his hands and fingernails, real fingernails. Zandrine had to cut them this morning. Isn't it true, Zandrine? The woman bowed her turbaned head majestically. Merci, madame. And the way he cries, went on Desiree, is deafening. Armand hurt him the other day as far away as LeBlanc's cabin. Madame Volmont had never removed her eyes from the child. She lifted it and walked with it over to the window that was the lightest. She scanned the baby narrowly, then looked as searchingly at Zandrine, whose face was turned to gaze across the fields. Yes, the child has grown, has changed, said Madame Valmond slowly as she replaced it beside its mother. What does Armand say? Desiree's face became suffused with a glow that was happiness itself. Oh, Armand is the proudest father in the parish, I believe, chiefly because it is a boy to bear his name, though he says not that he would have loved a girl as well. But I know it isn't true. I know he says that to please me. And, Mama, she added, drawing Madame Valmont's head down to her and speaking in a whisper, he hasn't punished one of them, not one of them since baby is born. Even Negrillon, who pretended to have burnt his leg that he might rest from work, he only laughed and said Negrillon was a great scamp. Oh, Mama, I'm so happy. It frightens me. What Desiree said was true. Marriage and later the birth of his son had softened Armand Aubigny's imperious and exacting nature greatly. This was what made the gentle Desiree so happy, for she loved him desperately. When he frowned, she trembled but loved him. When he smiled, she asked no greater blessing of God. But Armand's dark, handsome face had not often been disfigured by frowns since the day he fell in love with her. When the baby was about three months old, Desiree awoke one day to the conviction that there was something in the air menacing her peace. It was at first too subtle to grasp. It had only been a disquieting suggestion, an air of mystery among the blacks, unexpected visits from far-off neighbors who could hardly account for their coming. Then a strange and awful change in her husband's manner, which she dared not ask him to explain. When he spoke to her, it was with averted eyes, from which the old love light seemed to have gone out. He absented himself from home, and when there, avoided her presence and that of her child without excuse. And the very spirit of Satan seemed suddenly to take hold of him in his dealings with the slaves. Desiree was miserable enough to die. She sat in her room one hot afternoon, in her pignon, listlessly drawing through her fingers the strands of her long, silky brown hair that hung about her shoulders. The baby, half-naked, lay asleep upon her own great mahogany bed that was like a sumptuous throne with its satin-lined half-canopy. One of LeBlanc's little quadroon boys, half-naked too, stood fanning the child slowly with a fan of peacock feathers. Desiree's eyes had been fixed absently and sadly upon the baby while she was striving to penetrate the threatening mist that she felt closing about her. She looked from her child to the boy who stood beside him and back again, over and over. Ah! Oh! It was a cry that she could not help, which she was not conscious of having uttered, the blood turned like ice in her veins, and a clammy moisture gathered upon her face. She tried to speak to the little quadroon boy, but no sound would come at first. When he heard his name uttered, he looked up, and his mistress was pointing to the door. He laid aside the great soft fan and obediently stole away over the polished floor on his bare tiptoes. She stayed motionless, with gaze riveted upon her child, and her face the picture of fright. 
Presently her husband entered the room and without noticing her went to a table and began to search among some papers which it covered. Armand, she called to him in a voice which must have stabbed him if he was human. But he did not notice. Armand, she said again. Then she rose and tottered towards him. Armand, she panted once more, clutching his arm. Look at our child. What does it mean? Tell me. He coldly but gently loosened her fingers from about his arm and thrust the hand away from him. Tell me what it means, she cried despairingly. It means, he answered lightly, that the child is not white. It means that you are not white. A quick conception of all that this accusation meant for her nerved her with unwanted courage to deny it. It is a lie. It is not true. I am white. Look at my hair. It is brown. My eyes are gray, Armand. You know they are gray. And my skin is fair, seizing his wrist. Look at my hand. Whiter than yours, Armand. She laughed hysterically. As white as La Blanc's, he returned cruelly and went away, leaving her alone with their child. When she could hold a pen in her hand, she sent a despairing letter to Madame Valmond. My mother, they tell me I am not white. Armand has told me I am not white. For God's sake, tell them it is not true. You must know it is not true. I shall die. I must die. I cannot be so unhappy and live. The answer that came was brief. My own Desiree, come home to Valmond, back to your mother who loves you. Come with your child. When the letter reached Desiree, she went with it to her husband's study and laid it open upon the desk before which he sat. She was like a stone image, silent, white, motionless, after she placed it there. In silence, he ran his cold eyes over the written words. He said nothing. Shall I go, Armand? She asked in tones sharp with agonized suspense. Yes, go. Do you want me to go? Yes, I want you to go. He thought Almighty God had dealt cruelly and unjustly with him, and felt somehow that he was paying him back in kind when he stabbed thus into his wife's soul. Moreover, he no longer loved her, because of the unconscious injury she had brought upon his home and his name. She turned away like one stunned by a blow, and walked slowly toward the door, hoping he would call her back. Goodbye, Armand, she moaned. He did not answer her. That was his last blow at fate. Desiree went in search of her child. Zandrine was pacing the somber gallery with it. She took the little one from the nurse's arms with no word of explanation and, descending the steps, walked away under the live oak branches. It was an October afternoon. The sun was just sinking. Out in the still fields, the Negroes were picking cotton. Desiree had not changed the thin white garment nor the slippers which she wore. Her hair was uncovered, and the sun's rays brought a golden gleam from its brown meshes. She did not take the broad, beaten road which led to the far-off plantation of Valmond. She walked across a deserted field, where the stubble bruised her tender feet, so delicately shod, and tore her thin gown to shreds. She disappeared among the reeds and willows that grew thick along the banks of the deep, sluggish bayou. She did not come back again. Some weeks later, there was a curious scene enacted at Labrie. In the center of the smoothly swept backyard was a great bonfire. Armand Aubigny sat in the wide hallway that commanded a view of the spectacle, and it was he who dealt out to the half-dozen Negroes the material which kept this fire ablaze. A graceful cradle of willow, with all its dainty furbishings, was laid upon the pyre, which had already been fed with the richness of a priceless layette. Then there were silk gowns, and velvet and satin ones added to these. Lace, too, and embroideries, bonnets and gloves, for the corbet had been of rare quality. 
The last thing to go was a tiny bundle of letters, innocent little scribbles that Desiree had sent him during the days of their espousal. There was the remnant of one back in the drawer from which he took them, but it was not Desiree's. It was part of an old letter from his mother to his father. He read it. She was thanking God for the blessing of her husband's love. But above all, she wrote, night and day, I thank the good God for having so arranged our lives that our dear Armand will never know that his mother, who adores him, belongs to the race that is cursed with the brand of slavery. And now, The Sheriff's Children, by Charles W. Chestnut. Branson County, North Carolina, is in a sequestered district of one of the statist and most conservative states of the Union. Society in Branson County is almost primitive in its simplicity. Most of the white people own the farms they till, and even before the war, there were no very wealthy families to force their neighbors by comparison into the category of poor whites. To Branson County, and to most rural communities in the South, the war is the one historical event that overshadows all others. It is the era from which all local chronicles are dated. Births, deaths, marriages, storms, freshets. No description of the life of any Southern community would be perfect that failed to emphasize the all-pervading influence of the great conflict. Yet the fierce tide of war that had rushed through the cities and along the great highways of the country had, comparatively speaking, but little disturbed the sluggish current of life in this region, remote from railroads and navigable streams. To the north in Virginia, to the west in Tennessee, all along the seaboard the war had raged. But the thunder of its cannons had not disturbed the echoes of Branson County, where the loudest sounds heard were the crack of some hunter's rifle, the baying of some deep-mouthed hound, or the yodel of some tuneful negro on his way through the pine forest. To the east, Sherman's army had passed on its march to the sea, but no straggling band of bummers had penetrated the confines of Branson County. The war, it is true, had robbed the county of the flower of its young manhood. But the burden of taxation... The doubt and uncertainty of the conflict, and the sting of ultimate defeat, had been borne by the people with an apathy that robbed misfortune of half its sharpness. The nearest approach to town life afforded by Branson County is found in the little village of Troy, the county seat, a hamlet with a population of four or five thousand. Ten years makes little difference in the appearance of these remote southern towns— if a railroad is built through one of them, it infuses some enterprise. The social corpse is galvanized by the fresh blood of civilization that pulses along the farthest ramifications of our great system of commercial highways. At the period of which I write, no railroad had come to Troy. If a traveler, accustomed to the bustling life of cities, could have ridden through Troy on a summer day, he might have easily fancied himself in a deserted village— Around him he would have seen weather-beaten houses, innocent of paint, the shingled roofs in many instances covered with a rich growth of moss. Here and there he would have met a razor-backed hog, lazily rooting its way along the principal thoroughfare. And more than once he would probably have had to disturb the slumber of some yellow dog, dozing away the hours in the ardent sunshine, and reluctantly yielding up his place in the middle of the dusty road. On Saturdays, the village presented a somewhat livelier appearance, and the shade trees around the courthouse square and along Front Street served as hitching posts for a goodly number of horses and mules and stunted oxen belonging to the farmer folk who had come in to trade at the two or three local stores. A murder was a rare event in Branson County. Every well-informed citizen could tell the number of homicides committed in the county for fifty years back, and whether the slayer in any given instance had escaped either by flight or acquittal, or had suffered the penalty of the law. So, when it became known in Troy, early one Friday morning in summer, about ten years after the war, that old Captain Walker, 
who had served in Mexico under Scott and had left an arm on the field of Gettysburg, had been foully murdered during the night, there was intense excitement in the village. Business was practically suspended, and the citizens gathered in little groups to discuss the murder and speculate upon the identity of the murderer. It transpired from testimony at the coroner's inquest, held during the morning, that a strange mulatto had been seen going in the direction of Captain Walker's house the night before, and had been met going away from Troy early Friday morning by a farmer on his way to town. Other circumstances seemed to connect the stranger with the crime. The sheriff organized a posse to search for him, and in the early evening, when most of the citizens of Troy were at supper, the suspected man was brought in and lodged in the county jail. By the following morning, the news of the capture had spread to the farthest limits of the county. A much larger number of people than usual came to town that Saturday, bearded men in straw hats and blue homespun shirts, and butternut trousers of great amplitude of material and vagueness of outline, women in homespun frocks and slat bonnets, with faces as expressionless as the dreary sand hills which gave them a meager sustenance. The murder was almost the sole topic of conversation. A steady stream of curious observers visited the house of mourning and gazed upon the rugged face of the old veteran, now stiff and cold in death. And more than one eye dropped a tear at the remembrance of the cheery smile and the joke, sometimes superannuated, generally feeble, but always good-natured, with which the captain had been wont to greet his acquaintances. There was a growing sentiment of anger among these stern men toward the murderer who had thus cut down their friend, and a strong feeling that ordinary justice was too slight a punishment for such a crime. Toward noon, there was an informal gathering of citizens at Dan Tyson's store. "'I hear it loud that Square Cart is too sick to hold court this evening,' said one and that the preliminary hearing will have to go over till next week. A look of disappointment went round the crowd. It's the darndest, meanest murder ever committed in this county, said another with moody emphasis. I suppose the nigger loud the captain had some greenbacks, observed a third speaker. The captain, said another with an air of superior information, has left two barrels of Confederate money which he expected it'd be good some day or other. This statement gave rise to a discussion of the speculative value of Confederate money, but in a little while the conversation returned to the murder. Hangin' her too good for a murderer, said one. He ought to be burnt, steadier being hung. There was an impressive pause at this point, during which a jug of moonlight whiskey went the round of the crowd. Well said a round-shouldered farmer, who in spite of his peaceable expression and faded gray eye, was known to have been one of the most daring followers of a rebel guerrilla chieftain. What are you going to do about it? If you fellas are going to set down and let a worthless nigger kill the best white man in Branson and not say nothing or do nothing, I'll move out in the county. This speech gave tone and direction to the rest of the conversation. Whether the fear of losing the round-shouldered farmer operated to bring about the result or not is immaterial to this narrative. But, at all events, the crowd decided to lynch the Negro. They agreed that this was the least that could be done to avenge the death of their murdered friend, and that it was a becoming way in which to honor his memory. They had some vague notions of the majesty of the law and the rights of the citizens, but in the passion of the moment, these sunk into oblivion. A white man had been killed by a negro. The captain was an old soldier, said one of his friends solemnly. He'll sleep better when he knows that the court marshal has been helped and justice done. By agreement, the lynchers were to meet at Tyson's store at five o'clock in the afternoon and proceed thence to the jail, which was situated down the Lumberton Dirt Road, as the turnpike antedating the Plank Road was called about half a mile south of the courthouse. When the preliminaries of the lynching had been arranged and a committee appointed to manage the affair, the crowd dispersed, some to go to their dinners 
and some to secure recruits for the lynching party. It was 20 minutes to 5 o'clock when an excited Negro, panting and perspiring, rushed up to the back door of Sheriff Campbell's dwelling, which stood at a little distance from the jail and somewhat farther than the ladder building from the courthouse. A turbaned, colored woman came to the door in response to the Negro's knock. Hardy, says Nance. Hardy, brass Sam. Is the chef in? inquired the Negro. Yas, brass Sam. He's eating his dinner, was the answer. Will you ax him to step to the door a minute, says Nance? The woman went into the dining room, and a moment later the sheriff came to the door. He was a tall, muscular man, of a ruddier complexion than is usual among Southerners. A pair of keen, deep-set, gray eyes looked out from under bushy eyebrows, and about his mouth was a masterful expression, which a full beard, once sandy in color, but now profusely sprinkled with gray, could not entirely conceal. The day was hot. The sheriff had discarded his coat and vest, and had his white shirt open at the throat. "'What do you want, Sam?' he inquired of the negro, who stood hat in hand, wiping the moisture from his face with a ragged shirt sleeve. "'Sheriff, they going to hang the prisoner what's locked up in the jail. They are coming this way now. I was laying on a sack of the corn down at the stove, behind a pile of flour barrels, when I hearn Doc Kane and Colonel Wright talking about it. I slipped out in the back door and run here as fast as I could. I hearn you say down to the store once that you wouldn't let nobody take a prisoner away from you without walking over your dead body, and I thought I'd let you know before they come, so you can protect the prisoner. The sheriff listened calmly, but his face grew firmer and a determined gleam lit up in his gray eyes. His frame grew more erect, and he unconsciously assumed the attitude of a soldier who momentarily expects to meet the enemy face to face. Much obliged, Sam, he answered. I'll protect the prisoner. Who's coming? I don't know who all's coming, replied the Negro. There's Mr. McSwain and Doc Kane and Major McDonnell and Colonel White and a heap of others. I was so scared I done forgot more than half of them. I spect they must be most here by this time, so I'll get out in the way, for I don't want nobody for to think I was mixed up in this business. The Negro glanced nervously down the road toward the town and made a movement as if to go away. Won't you have some dinner first? asked the sheriff. The Negro looked longingly in at the open door and sniffed the appetizing odor of boiled pork and collards. I ain't got no time for the terror, Sheriff, he said. But Sis Nance might give me something I could carry in my hand and eat on the way. A moment later, Nancy brought him a huge sandwich of split corn pone with a thick slice of bacon inserted between the halves and a couple of baked yams. The Negro hastily replaced his ragged hat on his head, dropped the yams in the pocket of his capacious trousers, and taking the sandwich in his hand, hurried across the road and disappeared into the woods beyond. The sheriff re-entered the house and put on his coat and hat. He then took down a double-barreled shotgun and loaded it with buckshot. Filling the chamber of a revolver with fresh cartridges, he slipped it into the pocket of the sack coat which he wore. A comely young woman in a calico dress watched these proceedings with anxious surprise. "'Where are you going, father?' she asked. She had not heard the conversation with the Negro. I'm going over to the jail, responded the sheriff. There's a mob coming this way to lynch the nigger we've got locked up. But they won't do it, he added with emphasis. Oh, father, don't go, pleaded the girl, clinging to his arm. They'll shoot you if you don't give him up. You never mind me, Polly, said her father reassuringly, as he gently unclasped her hands from his arm. I'll take care of myself and the prisoner, too. There ain't a man in Branson County that would shoot me. Besides, I have faced fire too often to be scared away from my duty. You keep close in the house, he continued. And if anyone disturbs you, just use the old horse pistol in the top rear old drawer. It's a little old-fashioned, but it did good work a few years ago. The young girl shuddered at this sanguinary illusion, but made no further objection to her father's departure.
The sheriff of Branson was a man far above the average of the community in wealth, education, and social position. He had been one of the few families in the county that before the war had owned large estates and numerous slaves. He had graduated at the State University at Chapel Hill and had kept up some acquaintance with current literature and advanced thought. He had traveled some in his youth and was looked up to in the county as an authority on all subjects connected with the outer world. At first, an ardent supporter of the Union, he had opposed the secession movement in his native state as long as opposition availed to stem the tide of public opinion. Yielding at last to the force of circumstances, he had entered the Confederate service rather late in the war and served with distinction through several campaigns, rising in time to the rank of colonel. After the war, he had taken the oath of allegiance and had been chosen by the people as the most available candidate for the office of sheriff, to which he had been elected without opposition. He had filled the office for several terms and was universally popular with his constituents. Colonel or Sheriff Campbell, as he was indifferently called as the military or civil title happened to be the most important in the opinion of the person addressing him, had a high sense of the responsibility attaching to his office. He had sworn to do his duty faithfully, and he knew what his duty was as sheriff, perhaps more clearly than he had apprehended it in any other passages of his life. It was therefore with no uncertainty in regard to his course that he prepared his weapons and went over to the jail. He had no fears for Polly's safety. The sheriff had just locked the heavy door of the jail behind him when a half-dozen horsemen, followed by a crowd of men on foot, came round a bend in the road and drew near the jail. They halted in front of the picket fence that surrounded the building, while several of the committee of arrangements rode on a few rods further to the sheriff's house. One of them dismounted and rapped on the door with his riding whip. Is the sheriff at home? he inquired. No, he has just gone out, replied Polly, who had come to the door. We want the jail keys, he continued. They are not here, said Polly. The sheriff has them himself. Then she added with assumed indifference. He's at the jail now. The man turned away, and Polly went into the front room, from which she peered anxiously between the slats of the green blinds of a window that looked toward the jail. Meanwhile, the messenger returned to his companions and announced his discovery. It looked as though the sheriff had learned of their design and was preparing to resist it. One of them stepped forward and rapped on the jail door. Well, what is it? said the sheriff from within. We want to talk to you, sheriff, replied the spokesman. There was a little wicket in the door. This the sheriff opened and answered through it. All right, boys, talk away. You are all strangers to me, and I don't know what business you can have. The sheriff did not think it necessary to recognize anybody in particular on such an occasion. The question of identity sometimes comes up in the investigation of these extrajudicial executions. We're a committee of citizens, and we want to get into the jail. What for? It ain't much trouble to get into jail. Most people want to keep out. The mob was in no humor to appreciate a joke, and the sheriff's witticism fell dead upon an unresponsive audience. We want to talk to the nigger that killed Captain Walker. You can talk to that nigger in the courthouse when he's brought out for trial. Court will be in session here next week. I know what you fellas want, but you can't get my prisoner today. Do you want to take the bread out of a poor man's mouth? I get 75 cents a day for keeping this prisoner, and he's the only one in jail. I can't have my family suffer just to please you fellas. One or two young men in the crowd laughed at the idea of Sheriff Campbell's suffering for want of 75 cents a day, but they were frowned into silence by those who stood near them. If you don't let us in, cried a voice, we'll bust the door open. Bust away, answered the sheriff, raising his voice so that all could hear. But I give you fair warning. The first man that tries it will be filled with buckshot. I'm sheriff of this county. I know my duty and I mean to do it. Well, what's the use of kicking, sheriff? Argued one of the leaders of the mob. 
The nigger's sure to hang anyhow. He richly deserves it. And we've got to do something to teach the niggers their places, or white people won't be able to live in the county. There's no use talking, boys, responded the sheriff. I'm a white man outside, but in this jail I'm sheriff, and if this nigger's to be hung in this county, I propose to do the hanging. So you fellas might as well ride about face and march back to Troy. You've had a pleasant trip, and the exercise will be good for you. You know me. I've got powder and ball, and I've faced fire before now, with nothing between me and the enemy, and I don't mean to surrender this jail while I'm able to shoot. Having thus announced his determination, the sheriff closed and fastened the wicket, and looked around for the best position from which to defend the building. The crowd drew off a little, and the leaders conversed together in low tones. The Branson County Jail was a small, two-story brick building, strongly constructed, with no attempt at architectural ornamentation. Each story was divided into two large cells by a passage running from front to rear. A grated iron door gave entrance from the passage to each of the four cells. The jail seldom had many prisoners in it, and the lower windows had been boarded up. When the sheriff had closed the wicket, he ascended the steep wooden stairs to the upper floor. There was no window at the front of the upper passage, and the most available position from which to watch the movements of the crowd below was from the window of the cell occupied by the solitary prisoner. The sheriff unlocked the door and entered the cell. The prisoner was crouched in a corner, his yellow face blanched with terror, looking ghastly in the semi-darkness of the room. A cold perspiration had gathered on his forehead, and his teeth were chattering with affright. For God's sake, Sheriff, he muttered hoarsely. Don't let him lynch me. I didn't kill the old man. The sheriff glanced at the cowering wretch with a look of mingled contempt and loathing. Get up, he said sharply. You'll probably be hung sooner or later, but it shall not be today if I can help it. I'll unlock your fetters, and if I can't hold the jail, you'll have to make the best fight you can. If I'm shot, I'll consider my responsibility at an end. There were iron fetters on the prisoner's ankles and handcuffs on his wrists. These the sheriff unlocked, and they fell clanking to the floor. Keep back from the window, said the sheriff. They might shoot if they saw you. The sheriff drew toward the window a pine bench which formed a part of the scanty furniture of the cell and laid his revolver upon it. Then he took his gun in hand and took his stand at the side of the window where he could, with the least exposure of himself, watch the movements of the crowd below. The lynchers had not anticipated any determined resistance. Of course, they had looked for a formal protest, and perhaps a sufficient show of opposition to excuse the sheriff in the eye of any stickler for legal formalities. They had not, however, prepared to fight a battle, and no one of them seemed willing to lead an attack upon the jail. The leaders of the party conferred together with a good deal of animated gesticulation, which was visible to the sheriff from his outlook, though the distance was too great for him to hear what was said. At length, one of them broke away from the group and rode back to the main body of the lynchers, who were restlessly awaiting orders. "'Well, boys,' said the messenger, We'll have to let it go for the present. The sheriff says he'll shoot, and he's got the drop on us this time. There ain't any of us that want to follow Captain Walker just yet. Besides, sheriff is a good fellow, and we don't want to hurt him. But, he added, as if to reassure the crowd which began to show signs of disappointment, nigger might as well say his prayers, for he ain't got long to live. There was a murmur of dissent from the mob and several voices insisted that an attack be made on the jail. But pacific councils finally prevailed, and the mob sullenly withdrew. The sheriff stood at the window until they had disappeared around the bend in the road. He did not relax his watchfulness when the last one was out of sight. Their withdrawal might be a mere feint, to be followed by a further attempt. So closely indeed was his attention drawn to the outside— that he neither saw nor heard the prisoner creep stealthily across the floor, reach out his hand, and secure the revolver which lay on the bench behind the sheriff, and creep as noiselessly back to his place in the corner of the room. A moment after the last of the lynching party had disappeared, there was a shot fired from the woods across the road, 
a bullet whistled by the window and buried itself in the wooden casing a few inches from where the sheriff was standing. Quick as thought, with the instinct born of a semi-guerrilla army experience, he raised his gun and fired twice at the point from which a faint puff of smoke showed the hostile bullet to have been sent. He stood a moment, watching, and then rested his gun against the window and reached behind him mechanically for the other weapon. It was not on the bench. As the sheriff realized this fact, he turned his head and looked into the muzzle of the revolver. Stay where you are, sheriff, said the prisoner, his eyes glistening, his face almost ruddy with excitement. The sheriff mentally cursed his own carelessness for allowing him to be caught in such a predicament. He had not expected anything of the kind. He had relied on the Negro's cowardice and subordination in the presence of an armed white man as a matter of course. The sheriff was a brave man, but realized that the prisoner had him at an immense disadvantage. The two men stood thus for a moment, fighting a harmless duel with their eyes. Well, what do you mean to do? asked the sheriff with apparent calmness. To get away, of course, said the prisoner, in a tone which caused the sheriff to look at him more closely and with an involuntary feeling of apprehension. If the man was not mad, he was in a state of mind akin to madness and quite as dangerous. The sheriff felt that he must speak the prisoner fair and watch for a chance to turn the tables on him. The keen-eyed, desperate man before him was a different being altogether from the groveling wretch who had begged so piteously for life a few minutes ago. At length, the sheriff spoke. Is this your gratitude to me for saving your life at the risk of my own? If I had not done so, you would now be swinging from the limb of some neighboring tree. True, said the prisoner. You saved my life, but for how long? When you came in, you said court would sit next week. When the crowd went away, they said I had not long to live. It is merely a choice of two ropes. While there's life, there's hope, replied the sheriff. He uttered this commonplace mechanically, while his brain was busy in trying to think out some way of escape. If you are innocent, you can prove it. The mulatto kept his eye upon the sheriff. I didn't kill the old man, he replied. But I shall never be able to clear myself. I was at his house at nine o'clock. I stole from it the coat that was on my back when I was taken. I would be convicted, even with a fair trial, unless the real murderer were discovered beforehand. The sheriff knew this only too well. While he was thinking what argument next to use, the prisoner continued. Throw me the keys. No, unlock the door. The sheriff stood a moment, irresolute. The mulatto's eyes glittered ominously. The sheriff crossed the room and unlocked the door leading into the passage. Now go down and unlock the outside door. The heart of the sheriff leaped within him. Perhaps he might make a dash for liberty and gain the outside. He descended the narrow stairs, the prisoner keeping close behind him. The sheriff inserted the huge iron key into the lock. The rusty bolt yielded slowly. It still remained for him to pull the door open. Stop! thundered the mulatto, who seemed to divine the sheriff's purpose. Move a muscle and I'll blow your brains out! The sheriff obeyed. He realized that his chance had not yet come. Now, keep on that side of the passage and go back upstairs. Keeping the sheriff under cover of the revolver, the mulatto followed him up the stairs. The sheriff expected the prisoner to lock him into the cell and make his own escape. He had about come to the conclusion that the best thing he could do under the circumstances was to submit quietly and take his chances of recapturing the prisoner after the alarm had been given. The sheriff had faced death more than once upon the battlefield. A few minutes before, well armed and with a brick wall between him and them, he had dared a hundred men to fight. But he felt instinctively that the desperate man confronting him was not to be trifled with, and he was too prudent a man to risk his life against such heavy odds. He had Polly to look after, and there was a limit beyond which devotion to duty would be quixotic and even foolish. I want to get away, said the prisoner, and I don't want to be captured, for if I am, I know I will be hung on the spot. I am afraid, he added, somewhat reflectively, that in order to save myself, I shall have to kill you. Good God.
exclaimed the sheriff in involuntary terror. You would not kill the man to whom you owe your own life. You speak more truly than you know, replied the mulatto. I indeed owe my life to you. The sheriff started. He was capable of surprise, even in that moment of extreme peril. Who are you? He asked in amazement. Tom, Sicily's son, returned the other. He had closed the door and stood talking to the sheriff through the grated opening. Don't you remember Sicily? Sicily, whom you sold with her child, to the speculator on his way to Alabama? The sheriff did remember. He had been sorry for it many a time since. It had been the old story of debts, mortgages, and bad crops. He had quarreled with the mother. The price offered for her and her child had been unusually large, and he had yielded to the combination of anger and pecuniary stress. Good God, he gasped. You would not murder your own father. My father, replied the mulatto. It were well enough for me to claim the relationship, but it comes with poor grace from you to ask anything by reason of it. What father's duty have you ever performed for me? Did you give me your name, or even your protection? Other white men gave their colored sons freedom and money, and sent them to the free states. You sold me to the rice swamps. I at least gave you the life you cling to, murmured the sheriff. Life, said the prisoner with a sarcastic laugh. What kind of a life? You gave me your own blood, your own features. No man need look at us together twice to see that. And you gave me a black mother. Poor wretch. She died under the lash because she had enough womanhood to call her soul her own. You gave me a white man's spirit. And you made me a slave and crushed it out. But you are free now, said the sheriff. He had not doubted, could not doubt, the mulatto's word. He knew whose passions coursed beneath that swarthy skin and burned in the black eyes opposite his own. He saw in this mulatto what he himself might have become had not the safeguards of parental restraint and public opinion been thrown around him. Freedom to do what? replied the mulatto. Free in name but despised and scorned and set aside by the people whose race I belong far more than to my mother's. There are schools, said the sheriff. You have been to school. He had noticed that the mulatto spoke more eloquently and used better language than most Branson County people. I have been to school and dreamed when I went that I would work some marvelous change in my condition. But what did I learn? I learned to feel that no degree of learning or wisdom will change the color of my skin, and that I shall always wear what in my country is a badge of degradation. When I think about it seriously, I do not care particularly for such a life. It is the animal in me, not the man, that flees the gallows. I owe you nothing, he went on, and expect nothing of you and it would be no more than justice if I should avenge upon you my mother's wrongs and my own. But still, I hate to shoot you. I have never yet taken human life, for I did not kill the old captain. Will you promise to give no alarm and make no attempt to capture me until morning if I do not shoot? So absorbed were the two men in their colloquy and their tumultuous thoughts that neither of them had heard the door below move upon its hinges. Neither of them had heard the light step coming stealthily up the stairs, nor seen a slender form creep along the darkening passage toward the mulatto. The sheriff hesitated. The struggle between his love of life and his sense of duty was a terrific one. It may seem strange that a man who could sell his own child into slavery should hesitate at such a moment, when his life was trembling in the balance. But the baleful influence of human slavery poisoned the very fountains of life and created new standards of right. The sheriff was conscientious. His conscience had merely been warped by his environment. Let no one ask what his answer would have been. He was spared the necessity of a decision. Stop, said the mulatto. 
You need not promise. I could not trust you if you did. It is your life or mine. There is no one safe way for me. You must die. He raised his arm to fire. When there was a flash, a report from the passage behind him, his arm fell heavily at his side and the pistol dropped at his feet. The sheriff recovered first from his surprise and throwing open the door secured the fallen weapon. Then, seizing the prisoner, he thrust him into the cell and locked the door upon him. After which he turned to Polly, who leaned half fainting against the wall, her hands clasped over her heart. Oh, father, I was just in time. She cried hysterically and wildly sobbing threw herself into her father's arms. I watched until they all went away, she said. I heard the shot from the woods and I saw you shoot. Then when you did not come out, I feared something had happened, that perhaps you had been wounded. I got out the other pistol and ran over here. When I found the door open, I knew something was wrong, and when I heard voices, I crept up the stairs and reached the top, just in time to say he would kill you. Oh, it was a narrow escape. When she had grown somewhat calmer, the sheriff left her standing there and went back into the cell. The prisoner's arm was bleeding from a flesh wound. His bravado had given place to a stony apathy. There was no sign in his face of fear or disappointment or feeling of any kind. The sheriff sent Polly to the house for cloth and bound up the prisoner's wound with a rude skill acquired during his army life. I'll have a doctor come and dress the wound in the morning, he said to the prisoner. It will do very well until then if you keep quiet. If the doctor asks you how the wound was caused, you can say that you were struck by the bullet fired from the woods. It would do you no good to have it known that you were shot while attempting to escape. The prisoner uttered no word of thanks or apology, but sat in sullen silence. When the wounded arm had been bandaged, Polly and her father returned to the house. The sheriff was in an unusually thoughtful mood that evening. He put salt in his coffee at supper and poured vinegar over his pancakes. To many of Polly's questions, he returned random answers. When he had gone to bed, he lay awake for several hours. In the silent watches of the night, when he was alone with God, there came into his mind a flood of unaccustomed thoughts. An hour or two before, standing face to face with death, he had experienced a sensation similar to that which drowning men are said to feel, a kind of clarifying of the moral faculty in which the veil of the flesh with its obscuring passions and prejudices is pushed aside for a moment and all the acts of one's life stand out in the clear light of truth, in their correct proportions and relations, a state of mind in which one sees himself as God may be supposed to see him. In the reflection following his rescue, this feeling had given place for a time to far different emotions. But now, in the silence of midnight, something of this clearness of spirit returned to the sheriff. He saw that he had owed some duty to this son of his, that neither law nor custom could destroy a responsibility inherent in the nature of mankind. He could not thus, in the eyes of God at least, shake off the consequences of his sin. Had he never sinned, this wayward spirit would never come back from the vanished past to haunt him. As these thoughts came, his anger against the mulatto died away, and in its place there sprang up a great pity. The hand of parental authority might have restrained the passions he had seen burning in the prisoner's eyes when the desperate man spoke the words which had seemed to doom his father to death. The sheriff felt that he might have saved this fiery spirit from the slough of slavery, that he might have sent him free to the north and given him there, or in some other land, an opportunity to turn useful and honorable pursuits, the talents that had run to crime, perhaps to madness. He might, still less, have given this son of his the poor simulacrum of liberty which men of his caste could possess in a slaveholding community or least of all, but still something, he might have kept the boy on the plantation where the burdens of slavery would have fallen lightly upon him. The sheriff recalled his own youth. He had inherited an honored name to keep untarnished. He had had a future to make. The picture of a fair young bride had beckoned him on to happiness. 
The poor wretch, now stretched upon a pallet of straw between the brick walls of the jail, had had none of these things. No name, no father, no mother in the true meaning of motherhood. And until the past few years, no possible future. And then, one vague and shadowy in its outline, and dependent for form and substance upon the slow solution of a problem in which there were many unknown quantities. From what he might have done to what he might yet do was an easy transition for the awakened conscience of the sheriff. It occurred to him, purely as a hypothesis, that he might permit his prisoner to escape. But his oath of office, his duty as sheriff, stood in the way of such a course, and the sheriff dismissed the idea from his mind. He could, however, investigate the circumstances of the murder and move heaven and earth to discover the real criminal for he no longer doubted the prisoner's innocence. He could employ counsel for the accused, and perhaps influence public opinion in his favor. An acquittal once secured, some plan could be devised by which the sheriff might, in some degree, atone for his crime against this son of his, against society, against God. When the sheriff had reached this conclusion, he fell into an unquiet slumber, from which he awoke late the next morning. He went over to the jail before breakfast and found the prisoner lying on his pallet, his face turned to the wall. He did not move when the sheriff rattled the door. "'Good morning,' said the latter, in a tone intended to wake the prisoner. There was no response. The sheriff looked more keenly at the recumbent figure. There was an unnatural rigidity about its attitude. He hastily unlocked the door and, entering the cell, bent over the prostrate form." There was no sound of breathing. He turned the body over. It was cold and stiff. The prisoner had torn the badge from his wound and bled to death during the night. He had evidently been dead several hours. And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed Desiree's Baby by Kate Chopin and The Sheriff's Children by Charles W. Chestnut. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.